So welcome to our session today, everyone. This is our very first session of the monthly series, Crypto 101 First Principles, where we'll be speaking with industry leaders in the Web3 financial space, sharing real world knowledge, best practices, and experience. My name is Jenny. I'm from the solutions team here at Bitwave. And a little intro on myself. Um, I am a CPA turned crypto enthusiast and then a crypto enthusiast turned NFT project creator. And while I was immersed in the whole NFT space, I saw the pain points and the lack of resources um, that my community had in terms of crypto accounting. So I became really passionate about bridging that gap between crypto and accounting, which led me to Bitwave. And imagine my delight when I found a platform that was actually building for the gap. So I will say that I'm deep enough into crypto that I know there's always something that I don't know, and there's always something for me to learn, which leads me to our guest speaker, who I'm super excited to be learning from today. So I have the brilliant Amber Welch. Um, she is the Web3 Crypto Accounting Financial Director at Graphite Financial, here with me to kick off the first session of this training series. Um, welcome, Amber. If you could give us a brief intro and maybe share what inspired you to get into crypto, we can kind of get kicked off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I don't know if inspire is the right word, more like fell into. Um, so just a quick brief history on who I am in case you haven't met me or had a chance to talk to me before anywhere. Um, I have just shy of two decades of accounting experience, spent part of it in public accounting as an auditor, and then the rest of it in corporate accounting. Um, I worked everything from mall, a small mom and pop shop, um, literally like local up to, I was a worldwide manager at a $56 billion tech company that pretty much everyone would know the name of. So definitely been in the space for a long time, um, done a wide range of things. Uh, as far as like what actually got me here to where I'm at and my interest in it, so I dual majored in accounting and finance and computer science. My intent was to set for my CPA. And then I ended up so involved in the computer and science part of it as it like actually relates to finance um, that I kind of never have looked back. So when I joined Graphite's team, they had two recent sign-on uh, new clients. And they had people at the company that had some knowledge of cryptocurrency and kind of the Web3 space. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the term Web3, we'll touch on that later and it will make a lot more sense. And so they asked me actually before I got going, I went to like a company meetup because we're all remote. And one of the directors at the time had said, hey, how do you feel about cryptocurrency? And I'm like, great, I love tech. And he said, do you want to work on some cryptocurrency clients? And I was like, sure, why not? So literally from day one, it was dive right in. And then um, I've spent basically the last year making it a, you know, revenue producing industry for a company and haven't looked back. That sounds like the crypto space. You just really dive right in. <laughs> yeah. You learn as you go in anything crypto and Web3 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I have a follow up on that. How do crypto and accounting fit together exactly, Amber? So this is a question that I get a lot. Um, and kind of the answer is they don't, but also they do. So let me expand on that. At its core, accounting is pretty black and white, right? We have these set of rules depending on the country, if it's international, US, all of the above um, that we need to follow. But in the Web3 crypto space, obviously, if you're an individual, you need to worry about it from a tax perspective. If you are a company or running a company or helping assist clients that have companies, you need to worry about making sure that their financials are accurate and fairly represented. So the, the way they fit together is really about accurate representation. But that being said, the future really is in fintech, and there is a lot that most people don't even realize falls into this whole Web3 space outside of cryptocurrency itself that is really a crossover into the financial realm. Um, so there's a huge crossover between finance and technology specific to cryptocurrency and Web3, and I think a lot of people are going to see a huge amount of that roll out in the next year and it's gonna blow their mind what's happening. Yeah, I I definitely see crypto revolutionizing accounting, accounting revolutionizing, well, 
bring, bringing those traditional things back into crypto, it, it helps build the infrastructure of the entire Web3 space, so it's not so chaotic. Um, so I know we had talked previously about NFT projects and, and how you see NFT projects revolutionizing the accounting space and the crypto space. Can yeah, absolutely. more about that? Yeah, sure, sure. So I personally think that, especially in 2023, we're going to see a huge crop up of NFTs um, being utilized for a completely different methodology than most people immediately assume. So if you're here and you're uh, a beginner learner in like cryptocurrency and the whole space, um, your first train of thought, if you've heard of NFTs, is probably going to be like a picture of the apes project, right? It's going to be artwork or something that someone has paid some amount of money for that is their loan piece of art. But NFTs can be used for so much more than that. Um, I have clients and companies I've talked to all over the place that are using them to be the catalyst for smart contracts. Mm. Um, I've talked to people that are utilizing NFTs to hold the heritage mm. of um, even like identifying, like if something's authentic, so as an authentication device. So if I go and buy a Louis Vuitton purse, then mm -hmm. instead of them giving me a physical piece of paper, they may issue me an NFT to mm -hmm. show the trail of authentication of that product. Yeah. Um, we've talked to companies who are using it in the identity space in social mm -hmm. networking, um, yeah. and also in the space related to, um, I was trying to think, I just thought of one other one that I've seen a lot of lately too. Uh, but point being, I mean, house sales, business, day-to-day -day contracts, there are so many use cases for NFTs and most people stop right at the, the idea of it's artwork. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a huge influx of all of these other use cases in 2023 and people that didn't previously hear much beyond the art piece or kind of the basics are going to start going, oh, there's a little more to this cryptocurrency web three thing than maybe I realized. Yeah, there, there's so much more. I know one of my favorite projects is Cardano, and they issued, uh, they're called DIDs. I don't know what it stands for, but basically that is being used to track the uh, their educational history, right? So so like what classes have they taken, um, mm -hmm. what, what their grades are. That's all like stored on the blockchain, and they're, they're rolling this out in Africa for all these high school students. So I can see so many use cases beyond just pictures um, that are being flipped for insane prices yeah. that we can do use for NFTs. So absolutely, I think it there's just going to be so much more that's coming out this year. Um, yeah, I mean, think about, think about how cool it would be if as an individual in the US, mm -hmm. if I wanted to go see multiple different doctors for different things, mm -hmm. I could carry my own records with me all based off of one absolutely. NFT. And they're yeah. still secured, right? Because if I own that NFT and it's secured on my personal blockchain and wallet space. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So anyway, there is a ton of use cases. There's so many things that we can apply the technology to mm -hmm. that I think are now starting to be inspected. And that's where we're going to see it going, which is very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I know you're going to touch on this a little bit more in your presentation, so I'm going to move on. But I, I think we, we kind of just dove into like the, the complex stuff, but I want to kind of bring it back. And the whole premise of this first principle series is that what are first principles right so well we're trying to break down this very broad and complex topic of crypto into the elemental pieces because mm -hmm. once we know the fundamentals we can use those to build more complex thoughts so just an example of this for example if we learn the alphabet right once we learn the alphabet we can uh make words right and so once we know how to write words we can make sentences and once you make sentences you can make paragraphs then essays become books and then we have entire libraries right so i would like to get your opinion on what you feel like the first principles are of crypto. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's funny that you gave that example because I'm currently using Duolingo to learn Hindi and I'm still on like the letters and sounds because it's a very complex, complicated mm -hmm. language, but it's a great example because that's exactly how you would break down anything you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and cryptocurrency and Web3 really isn't any different. So from a first principle standpoint, what I recommend to my teams internally and anybody that wants to talk to me about it, because I'm always, always open to talking about this, it's a fascinating subject, um, is that you start with the most common buzzwords that you're going to hear. So for most people, that's going to probably be cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, NFT, like 
blockchain, some of the very, very basics. If you can start to wrap your head around those foundational basics, then the next thing you can do is start looking at other ways that they apply. And from a finance perspective, I would say the next principle is to look at the existing guidance and um, thought processes in place. Now, there's not much. We all know that for the most part. Um, so right now, there's a lot of collective discussion uh, and collaboration, which is huge and very, very important. And I think if you start to research and understand what there is in the form of guidance, and kind of the direction we should go from a finance perspective in this space specifically, then the mm -hmm. final step that's gonna kind of not really take you the rest of the way, because I think you said it earlier, there's always something to learn, which is part of why I love this space. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like other industries where you kind of may learn the bulk of what there is to learn and then you're an expert and there's nothing more. There's so much that you can do with this space that the learning never ends. Um, but the final piece, and this is key, no matter if you are doing this or 10 other things, is understanding and learning how to research. Once you learn how to research, you can become an educated expert in pretty much anything because of yeah. with technology and like the very basis and principles of what blockchain and Web3 is built on is open sourced information. Mm -hmm. um, so learning how to research and really be able to dig into, and that's honestly how I started when I was in college and taking computer science. I would see a word and I would read the definition in my textbook. And then I would end up down a rabbit hole watching YouTube videos and reading articles. And then those would produce more words that I wasn't quite sure what they meant. And it just went on and on and on. And I still do that to this day. Someone will ask a question, I'll go down the rabbit hole of researching it. And then that will get me on a tangent of learning like 10 new things for the day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gross. That's exactly how I got into crypto too. It actually started in like Discord channels. So the, the avenues in which you can research crypto are, they're just monumental. It's it's everywhere. It's social media, TikTok, YouTube, it's it's Instagram, it's Twitter, it's, it's Discord. I just, when I'm interested in a topic, I just hop into like the discord and I read through all those messages and the terminology starts like sticking and, and it requires a lot of, I mean, you have to be interested in learning, I think to, to really, you know, be able to um, absorb in this space and really be able to participate, but, but also it takes some time and it can be intimidating. So really just like starting anywhere. And there, there are some great resources out there. And I know that you have some additional education resources that you're going to be sharing a little bit later in, in your presentation. Um, and I actually think if we wanted to go to your presentation, we can pop over there now. Um, so this will be our, in this entire series, it'll be like a micro lesson and we're going to have, we're going to give our guest speakers free reign on what they want to teach within this series. So Thank you for coming up with this topic. We're going to dis discover some things about Web3 and intro to crypto. And hopefully this isn't too basic. I'm sure there will be things that everybody learns on here. Um, if you're a little bit more of an intermediate level, then this may just be repetitive or a different take on some of that. Uh, that's one of the things I love about this space is there's a lot of viewpoints and a lot of collaboration. Um, so I would recommend if you are just dipping your toes into it and just trying to learn to get involved in as many spaces as you can, and you'll be shocked at how quickly you start to understand and pick things up. Um, so let me just click past here. All right. So just to give you kind of an overview of what I'm going to attempt to go through, some of it I'm going to go through pretty quickly just because of, um, I want to make sure I get to everything that's useful. Um, we're going to touch on Web3 and clients because I think the audience overall is probably going to be dealing with either clients or maybe their own companies. And so it's going to be similar. Uh, the basics of cryptocurrency, identifying Web3 in client data, because sometimes that's the biggest hassle or obstacle to overcome initially. A little bit of guidance because there's not a lot out there, but we'll touch on what we know so far. Um, a manual reconciliation. So you can't always use a Bitwave. I am a big fan of Bitwave. Obviously, the majority of my clients are fans of Bitwave. Um, but, you know, there is a manual process. And I think even if you're using Bitwave as your subledger, it's very important to understand at a functional level what's happening. So I want to touch on the reconciliation just so that people get kind of an idea of what that would look like. 
Um, and then we'll talk about some additional education opportunities and suggestions where I started. That's kind of how I got into it. Um, so just to start out, Web3 and clients. The way I tend to classify clients when I'm looking at someone that might be coming on to Graphite as a new client is a casual user, a semi-casual, a medium, or like a true Web3 company. And I'm not going to read through all of this verbatim because that would be absolutely boring. Uh, but the basic way to think about it is your most casual user is going to be Joe Schmo that lives next door and says, yeah, I bought some Bitcoin. And that's your casual user. There isn't much use case beyond that. And it incrementally goes up. Um, when you get to a true Web3 company, if they're not fully decentralized, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about like definitions, um, they are at least fully engaged in like blockchain technology, whether that's peripherally supporting other Web3 companies or if it's actively being completely decentralized. I've seen both. Um, and I consider both of those truly Web3 companies because their focus is on the goals of what Web3 stands for. And I keep saying Web3. I'm also going to define that in a second, which I think will help a little bit more as well. Um, so the basics. We're going to go over this next. What is Web3? What's blockchain? What is decentralized finance? And what is cryptocurrency? They're four pretty common phrases, most of which I would assume the vast majority of people have at least heard, even if they don't know what they are. But I think it's important to kind of talk about them at their base level. Again, that's kind of the first principle if you're wanting to jump into this understanding and knowledge. Uh, so we're going to start with Web3. I keep saying that. If you're unsure of why I keep saying that instead of cryptocurrency, you're not alone. Uh, so a lot of people used to have this idea that cryptocurrency was the whole space. And in reality, I think I read somewhere that it makes up like a single digit percentage of the actual Web3 space. So you can kind of see some key points I put on here. Web3 originally, and my husband has a tech background. So when, when I got into this and he started talking to me about it, he's like, I thought Web3 was AI. It is. So it's absolutely part of the space, but there's a lot more than that. The key point of Web3 is we're moving to an open source environment. So when we think about prior, Web3, there must have been a Web2, right? Or a Web1, yes. Um, Web2, or sometimes called Web2 and a half, is really what the vast majority of people, if you were to walk outside and ask them, like, hey, do you know what this is? They're going to say no, probably, but they're familiar with it. So when you're thinking of what came before Web3, we're talking about the social aspect of the internet. Facebook revolutionized, like, the way most of us, um, if you're anywhere near my age, revolutionized our experience online. Um, of course, I come back from when dial-up was pretty commonplace, didn't have a computer in the house till I was in high school, so a little bit different of an experience on my end than some of the younger people probably watching, but that truly was the beginning of what we saw as Web 2 and that whole social environment, which is every day, everywhere we walk. Now, Web 3 takes it further because it takes the technology and it wants to make it accessible to everybody and transparent. Um, so that's kind of like the basics of what Web3 is. There's a lot to it. I highly recommend just Googling Web3 and you will get just a plethora of information that you can read about. Like, And to be honest, like that's where I started, right? When I was first in college and first learning about all things uh, crypto and technology-based, my Googling and research abilities were, what's the definition of? And then that's where I started to learn how to research and be better at learning. Um, blockchain, this is a slide I usually spend a little more time on and I, and I want to give um, a bit of a, not a story, more of an analogy that really helps people um, mentally understand what blockchain is. Because at face value, it can be a little bit intimidating if you read the definition. You will look at it and be like, okay, I understand the word separately, but sometimes putting it all together is a little bit much. Um, so thinking about it as a decentralized and distributed ledger of transactions from an accountant's point of view, part of that makes sense. But here's the analogy that I like to give. If you were to walk into a building and conceptually the blockchain was a tangible item, how I would explain it is a vault full of safes. So you can go to a bank, which is centralized finance, and you can purchase or rent a private vault for your stuff. 
you have the key to it, they have the key to it, and you go in and you put your things in there. It's locked, it's put away, no one can see in it. But blockchain is like the flip opposite side of that. So essentially the way it operates is this stack of glass boxes. Everybody's information, not your personal information, obviously we're not sharing social security numbers and names and things like that, but the transactions that are happening are those individual glass boxes and they stack on top of each other and they connect. And at any one time, I have the ability to go look at any part of that chain of glass boxes. Now I don't have the ability to go in and access what's in them, but I can look at them. So it brings a level of transparency to an industry and an area via technology that we've never seen before. Um, that's usually the most simplistic way I know how to kind of explain blockchain. And I think it really helps give a visual of what that means. Now, obviously there's more to it. There always is in this space. Um, but I think that at least gives most people an idea of how to mentally conceptualize blockchain versus just like the standard definition, which is sometimes hard. Um, there's some really entertaining explanations of blockchain. So if you ever want to get a chuckle or just have like some extra mental capacity for the day to like unwind and still be like doing something educational, go look up analogies for blockchain and you will be entertained. Um, so DeFi, decentralized finance is basically the opposite of every financial system you know now, like on its base level. And I used this image of kind of this opaque milky window very intentionally. So one piece of information that really drove the DeFi, which is the decentralized finance space related to Web3 and cryptocurrency, is this not an idea, but the very fact that most of the world's population does not have access to basic banking and financial needs. Um, living in the US, we greatly don't realize that, but in poverty stricken areas and in a lot of other countries, um, and very much so here in the US, we just do a really good job of not making it as obvious. People do not have the ability to have access to bank accounts, to loans, to credit, um, all sorts of financial needs. And one of the things that decentralized finance does is because of its open source nature, its transparency nature, it really allows access to anybody and everybody, which is really one of the foundational points behind Web3. So the reason I said I used this opaque window is in the US, the financial industry is very opaque. There are a handful of people making all of the decisions for the majority of the population, but we don't necessarily always know those details. We're not part of the decisions. We don't get to necessarily see the workings. A bank will just roll out and say, hey, this is the interest rate or this is you know, what's available. Um, so it's an opaque and very guarded environment. Uh, with decentralized finance, it's the exact opposite, like I explained. Um, and so it gives everybody a chance to really be involved and a part of things. And it opens everything up to everybody, which is, I think, a beautiful thing because education is amazing. Um, so crypto is probably the word most people coming to this or are unfamiliar with anything Web3 are going to know. Uh, I would venture to say in the last couple of years, the majority of people have at least heard the word crypto or cryptocurrency. Maybe not everybody's heard much past that. Um, but at its very base, it's just the currency. It's the tokens that are created that are utilized on the blockchain to do business, to do um, different forms of banking. I mean, like the use cases are endless. And every day I see a new one that blows my mind. And I'm like, how in the world do people come up with these things? Um, if you've heard more than cryptocurrency, you're probably going to be familiar with like Bitcoin or Ethereum. But there are a slew of new protocols being written. There's a slew of networks and exchanges. Um, and all of those things are kind of the next level of those foundational principles. So you, you learn the first principles, you understand on those basic principles, how to utilize them from a finance piece. And that's when you start down the rabbit hole learning these other words to do with protocols and wallets and exchanges. Um, because of how those all operate really do affect accounting from a finance standpoint. And then being able to identify data, this is key in the finance space. So 
I cannot tell you the number of times I have been on a call with a potential client. And if you don't ask the right question, you would never know that they have any dealings on chain at all. Uh, I recently had a call that with a now client and in the course of conversation and the depth of the questions I asked, they were like, oh, well, we don't have any. And just as reference, we refer to cryptocurrency and other similar things as digital assets, which we'll get into when we talk about the, um, the guidance that exists now. But they said, oh, we don't have any digital assets on our financials currently because all we have is gas fees, which is a function of like doing business on chain or doing these transactions on chain. Well, much to their chagrin, those need to be on their financials as well because it is part of, it's just like bank fees, right? It's paying something that affects their financials. So identifying the data in a client's information um, or in your own company's information is the very first step of being able to utilize it in the finance space. Um, and so I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna read through the whole slide. Hopefully you guys can read through it while I'm talking, but there are definitely a lot of questions that you can dive into. Um, and the amount of questions and the depth of knowledge that you're gonna have is gonna build as you grow your knowledge in the space. And it will allow you to have really fruitful conversations either in your own company, um, in the firm you work for or with the clients you're dealing with. And it will, take you from being able to just talk about like the basics to identifying things that could completely change like the tax implications for a company. Um, some of the big ones I will touch on on here is just making sure you identify all of the wallets. Um, just as a, a base definition, wallets are where they hold their different tokens of cryptocurrency among other formats. And a lot of times companies won't do a good job of realizing they need to disclose all of them. They'll think, oh, that was just for development. So that maybe they fail to tell you. Um, so being able to ask the questions to dive into that is important. Identifying if in the course of their business or in the course of your business that you're actually utilizing transactions on chain. To you, it might just be a smart contract, but there is actually a financial impact typically those things need to be represented in some way on your financials. And that's extremely important. And lately, especially in this last year, an area, and this is definitely more of an intermediate and above level, so I'm not going to go into depth, but that I've seen a lot of is we're starting to see a lot of business functions for employees. And when I say that, I mean, historically, you go to work for a company, you will potentially get stock options. Now we're starting to see a lot of Web3 companies doing token options. Um, if they've created their own token or they're writing their own protocol, there are, you know, governance tokens maybe attached to the functions of their business. And those are starting to come into play, which is a super interesting use case that is very closely being watched and talked about in the groups that I, that I um, have discussions in. Um, so definitely a lot of things you can dig into. There's a lot of topics, again, just like the whole space, it's endless. Mm -hmm. So really learning like what is applicable to you with the information is going to go a long way and allowing you to know how to dig in. Um, guidance. And I don't know why I picked a little piggy for this. I think I just thought it was cute. So I, I don't remember if there was actually a reason behind that little image, <laughs> just for whatever that's worth. Um, the bulk of our guidance right now is actually through the U.S. IRS. Um, recently, we've had a lot of meetings through FASB, which have been very fruitful and very exciting for most of us working in the space. Uh, but the basics of these are pretty straightforward from an accounting perspective. Um, prior to all of the FASB recent guidance that they're still in process of officially voting on and getting past those 75 day windows, um, the IRS, their preferred method is FIFO as far as any digital assets. The other key thing is all cryptocurrency, NFTs, all of the different things that are occurring in the space and on chain are intangible assets. Now, some of this has shifted a little bit in recent months with FASB's guidance, some additional discussion with the IRS. Obviously, the SEC's had a lot of opinions on everything lately um, after the whole events of the last few months that we won't even talk about. Um, and so I think we're going to see a lot of shifts potentially in the near future related to some of these. But what we do know right now is aside from inventory based NFTs and things that are functioning as like truly what you would consider an asset that's inventory that you're selling as a good, 
Um, the rest of it are intangible assets. So the IRS has asked that we use um, primarily FIFO. I've seen some other use cases. Our group primarily uses FIFO. Uh, we think it's the most advantageous and conservative approach from a financial standpoint for our clients. Um, it's important that we understand that there are unrealized and realized gains. So Graphite's take on this is always to go the most conservative approach on the guidance. Um, I get asked a lot how I come up with the methods to make those decisions when guidance doesn't exist. Um, so I am going to kind of explain that now because I think from a financial perspective, that'll be very helpful for people trying to understand crypto accounting and kind of get into this. Um, so first, again, back to collaboration. Um, I definitely have a lot of resources and people at other, like even our competitors that I'm friends with, that I've networked with, Slack groups, um, tons of people all over in different settings, whether it's founders, big four firms, I mean, like you name it, I'm talking to them. And we're all asking each other these questions. And so we talk through our opinions on them. And then I take those opinions. I bundle them with the existing guidance, which as you can see is very limited. And then the ultimate decision that we make, we apply the most conservative approach we can based on similar situations in a centralized world. So for example, I recently had someone ask me um, about, again, a slightly more advanced topic related to airdrops and tax implications and how they should recognize the basis and when. Um, and my answer was pretty straightforward. And where I came to that information was a combination of how has the government and the guiding forces that be treated it on non-Web3 items, right? So like we're talking about the SEC um, and FASB and IRS, how have they treated things that aren't in this space that we can say these are similar items, even though we know they're different. And the reason I do that in our conservative approach is realistically, at the end of the day, when the guidance does get created, when laws do go into place, the likelihood of them falling into line with things that already exist is high. So I want to protect my clients and make sure that the approach we take is going to be as closely tied to existing guidance and law um, as it can be because of the chance of there being some huge painful tax implication or something that crosses the line into illegality um, is going to be much more slim and protected. So I would definitely recommend, there's a really great link the IRS has that's like a frequently asked questions specific to digital assets. And when I say frequently asked questions, I mean, they have a lot of them on there and dig into those, start reading through those. They give a lot of information specific to how they want to see things handled. FASB is the same way. They've had a lot of meetings lately. They went from not talking about it at all to the last like eight months. It's on regular rotation in their conversations. And they've released a lot of information um, about how they want to see some of the treatment specifically around NFTs and impairment change. Um, we're pretty happy about the impairment change that's coming because it's a lot less work. Uh, but also, also, I do want to mention Bitwave did recently have a webinar. I think you guys posted it somewhere that you could rewatch it. They did go through all those FASB information pieces. Definitely go watch that because it's very informational. Um, so this I'm briefly going to touch on. So Bitwave is a fantastic product. Obviously, this is a very outdated slide. It says FTX up there at the top. I decided not to change it because it's still valid, um, even though the FTX piece is not. So this is a glimpse of the manual process that my team was using prior to getting to know Bitwave, prior to really diving into clients that had so many transactions, it wasn't feasible. And essentially it's an Excel workbook that applies a FIFO method. Um, there's a separate tab for the deposits that rolls in and it takes into account all of the rolling pieces. And there are many that go into properly accounting for that intangible asset piece. Now, what I will say, 100% use a product like Bitwave. Bitwave Subledger is fantastic. Um, no, they're not paying me to endorse them. I just genuinely love their product. Uh, but I do still think no matter if you are going to use a Subledger or not, that it's important to understand as much as you can about the flow of funds behind the actual numbers that you're creating. And so I recommend, and I, we do this internally, 
is everybody start with really basic level information. Um, so literally basic swaps, basic deposits into the account, basic disbursements from the account, start scheduling them out using something similar to this and understand what that flow of funds looks like, applying the proper method that your company or um, firm is going to use. And it will start to put the pieces together of what that means and make it much more real life conceptual instead of this imaginary pie in the sky. Like I know I started with this amount of Ethereum and I ended up with USDC and I have no idea what happened in the middle. Um, so definitely take the time to learn this. I think it's a valuable, a valuable place to start. Um, I haven't gone looking to see if there are any like templates out there that anyone has created, but, uh, and I'm honestly happy to share a, a very generalized template like this without any information, just with some like stock information in it that people can use to kind of play around with it. Um, I think it's extremely helpful to understand how things flow and how they work in order to understand how it all fits together. Um, so chart of accounts setup is definitely another area that most finance people are not sure what to do with. If you're setting it up manually um, and not using a subledger, we always just create the intangible asset accounts. Uh, I like to break them out by token unless it's like a staking client or someone that's going to have like so many types that it's just not feasible. Um, I think that that's nice because you can reconcile to each token when you're doing it manually. Now, that being said, the other differences that you're going to see is um, if you're using a subledger system like Bitwave, you actually end up with an account under cash and cash equivalents. Obviously, if you dive into the IRS regulations, it is not a cash or cash equivalent. So it's important to still set up the intangible account and reclass if you're going to be presenting financials to anybody um, outside of your organization. From an internal reporting perspective, you can absolutely just leave it sit there in the cash and cash equivalents because you're just making sure everything reconciles. Um, but for our clients where they are presenting that to other people, we do reclass it to intangibles. The other accounts that you're going to see beyond that, you're going to typically see an expense account related to gas fees. We typically just call it like crypto fees because that's pretty well um, encapsulated and it catches everything. And then you're also going to see, um, depending on what kind of digital asset you have, you may have an impairment account and you're always going to have a gains and losses account. Um, so those are the primary things you're going to see different on your chart of accounts. It's not a great deal of change, but it, it is a little bit different than what most of us are used to. Um, and then kind of to wrap up things before we start diving into like Q&A and anything else, I recommend a few places to start. Um, Bitwave. Bitwave is a, a wealth of information. They actually have a lot of resources on their website. Um, they have really great resources to walk through their whole product. And as part of walking through the product, they do a really excellent job of explaining how things function. Um, I know they have constant rotations of certifications for their product. And in certifying with their product, they also basically are teaching you basics of crypto accounting. Um, so definitely, I recommend them. They're at the top of the list. Uh, my company's website also has a lot of resources on it as well. Um, I try to do regular info pieces that we publish um, and put out there. Uh, LinkedIn is a great resource. There is a ton of groups available that have constant conversation, posts to um, news articles. Um, and then additionally, and on top of what's listed on here, um, I will tell you one of the great resources I found was Coursera. Uh, they have a couple different options for people that maybe don't want to pay for a whole year where you can dive in. They have like an entire DeFi certification course that's fantastic through Duke. I cannot tell you the amount of information in that course. I actually have taken it and done the certification and was thinking about recently going back through it. Just because of my knowledge has grown so much, I feel like I would get even more out of it and things that maybe the first time I really didn't grasp would sink in a lot better. Um, in addition to these, I would recommend YouTube and TikTok. Um, definitely easy free resources. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can just search like the most basic things on there and you will just get fantastic content for free. Um, and then obviously there's, I mean, like anywhere you look, basically if you go looking, you're gonna find resources to learn. Um, again, I think I have reminders set on Google that flags out alerts for anything with certain keywords related to the space. So that's always an interesting place to start too, because if there's just a lot of articles that most people don't see, 
because if maybe their newsfeed's not curated to that, um, that you can start to dive into. Uh, but there's just a whole lot of opportunity to learn if you want to learn. I love something you had mentioned was about the collaborative nature of the crypto space. I love that, Amber, because I think it's like a few short years ago, 2017, I don't remember there being so many working groups where you could join to really push the industry forward. And I, I know not everyone is, especially retail investors, are, are a fan of regulation, but I do think that working together to, to get this industry regulated is going to encourage the mass adoption of the crypto space. So I, I love that you did touch on that. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's an interesting point that I think is kind of important to expand on a little bit. Um, so for the people that are joining us that are from like a financial background specifically, they're definitely going to know what I mean. And I know you do, obviously, with your background. There's almost like a sports camaraderie between public firms and even companies, right? They're your competition. Mm -hmm. um, so you typically, even like back when I was in public accounting, we would do these career fairs to try to like potentially get new students as interns. You didn't want to talk to your competitors. <laughs> like you didn't want to have any conversations with them. You don't want them to know what your internship process is like. Nothing. It's like giant yeah. black wall. No one can know mm -hmm. anything. And this space is 100% different. Um, like I mentioned before, I'm in Slack groups that are just filled with not just founders, but people at Graphite's direct competitors. And I consider them dear business friends because, uh, and I meet with some of them regularly in like women in crypto groups and things. And they have so much knowledge to share um, and so much discussion. It's just, I love that collaboration. And I honestly, to my very core, I think the companies that we're going to see really succeed in Web3 as Web3 companies are going to be the ones that are the most collaborative with other companies. I think that's part of why Bitwave has been so successful because you guys are fantastically collaborative. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really foresee, I, I see that happening in the Bitwave community. I, I see people answering questions to help each other out, to support each other, to share resources. I think that is one of the best parts of being in this entire like Web3 and crypto space. Well, it's um, the very nature of what it's built on, which is why it's exactly. so Exactly. It's the decentralized like tenet of crypto. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if there's any questions, uh, I wanna encourage anyone to just drop it in the Q&A um, so that we can have our lovely Amber uh, give some of her expertise. I have a question. Um, I would like to know if there are any challenges in your day-to-day -day working with crypto and what pro tips you have in solving those challenges. Oh, there's always a challenge. There's always <laughs> a challenge. I mean, anybody in finance will tell you there is always a challenge to be had. Um, probably the biggest challenge that I see is just ensuring that we have all of the data and that it's complete and accurate. Um, but I think that's just a general finance challenge as a whole. Yeah. Uh, with cryptocurrency specifically though, I would say being able to impart the knowledge on enough people for things to function smoothly because the space changes so quickly and because of there is just so much to it. Um, and like I mentioned before, no matter how much you know, you never know all of it because of it's just so vast and the technology is so amazing. Um, I think the challenge there is really being able to make sure that you are on top of it. And it really does always go back to the research. Unfortunately, that's probably always going to be the default answer is learn to ask questions. Um, I think something I see a lot, and we see this internally, I've seen it everywhere I've worked, is people are afraid to ask a question. Um, a lot of times they think if I ask that, someone else already knows it and they're going to think I'm dumb. And the reality is, is everybody is probably thinking of the same question. Mm -hmm. And really the people who are dumb are the ones who are afraid to ask it uh, because of, you're shorting yourself out of knowledge. So we really encourage questions at Graphite. Um, I really encourage my teams to ask questions to me. I like them to like get in there and try it. I have this motto, like even if you fail miserably, that's probably 10% less I have to do. And in the process, you're gonna learn 10% more than you knew. And the next time it's gonna be 20%. So ask the questions, learn how to research. Um, you're gonna come across all kinds of interesting things that are gonna be bumps in the road. 
I definitely agree. I, I always say that there's no stupid question because I believe that stupid questions are the building blocks of mastery. So I, any question, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that asks questions and that is how you get to know crypto. Um, we did have a couple questions. Um, are there financial statements produced from this? Um, I don't know specifically what this is, so I'm just going to discuss financial statements as a whole. Yes. So for our clients, we are producing monthly financials. Um, and essentially because of you are including digital assets the proper way on your chart of accounts and in your transaction levels. Um, and one word we didn't define that in hindsight, I definitely should have is fiat which most people that aren't in the space are gonna be like, oh, the little tiny car. No, there is also a little tiny car, but fiat is the common word used for like regular currency. So euros and pesos and US dollars. Um, and so basically we're taking all of these transactions that are happening in these other currencies and we're creating them in fiat so that we can show them like we do any other bank transaction on the financials. So at the end of the day, yes, you have a standard balance sheet, a standard p &L, standard cash flow, and you are accounting for the same changes um, month over month that you would in any other way. You just are going about it in a little bit different manner to get it from whatever currency you're working with or multiple to like fiat, the same way you would if you were working with multiple currencies around the world. Absolutely. Um, another question that we got, are there specific challenges of operating a crypto accounting practice within an otherwise traditional firm? Absolutely. Um, so again, one of the biggest challenges is knowledge, right? Because of your teams may be really good at e-commerce or healthcare or SaaS, but you can't always apply all of the same principles to a Web3 company. Now, what I tell my teams internally is 80% of what you're going to do, if not more, is going to be very traditional and not that much different than any other client. But it's that piece that's not, that's going to create the most confusion and stress and kind of just needing to get additional understanding. Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest challenge. And then the other challenge is, at least for now, being able to support why you're doing things the way you're doing. Right now we have this lack of guidance. So I refer to us as the wild west of accounting in the web three space for anybody who's doing crypto accounting, which I personally love. Um, because of all of us that are involved at this level now are the ones that are defining what's going to happen later. Um, and we haven't seen anything like that in decades because of accounting has been fairly black and white for a very long time. Um, so being able to, for a nerdy way of saying it, revolutionize the accounting space is very exciting. Oh, really? Re -re revolutionary. I mean, it's yeah. exciting. So getting to dictate that, the one piece of advice I would give if you're in that situation is whatever decision you come to, standardize it across your entire firm. Because if you treat, if you have a situation and you treat it different um, from client to client, then I always think of it as if I were called into court and they asked me, why did you choose to do this with your client's financials? And I'm responsible for that, right? I have to answer to that. We've seen a lot of people lately having to answer to those decisions. I wanna make sure that I can say, I chose it because of X, Y, and Z. It's a conservative approach. It's in line with guidance that already exists on similar situations. And further, I standardized it. So I applied this across all of my clients as much as possible in the same way. I feel like that holds a lot more weight than just going into everything case by case. Absolutely. Really great questions. Um, let's see. How do you get your clients to understand and appreciate the level of expertise and work required to do crypto accounting well? <laughs> so this is actually, I laugh because of, it's one of the talking points that I usually will specify when I'm talking to potential clients. Um, it's super easy to throw out a buzzword. I mean, we all do it, right? Like even the most honest individual will embellish something at some point in their life. Uh, but the first thing I think you have to realize is this is not the place to embellish. And also the more transparent you can be with clients or potential clients, the 
better they are going to trust anything else that you supply to them. So I operate in a very black and white and transparent way. I have absolutely told potential clients I did not think they were a good fit for us because either they were just not a good fit for us as a like a group, as a financial group, or maybe we didn't have everything in place to properly um, support them at that time. Um, so I think getting the buy-in is really built on trust and being able to understand the client's business. So I really enmesh myself in my client's business as if I work directly for them. And then once that trust is established and they can see that you're feeding it in a whole plethora of other ways, they're going to have a lot more trust in you for, you know, anything else that you bring to them. Now with finance, anybody that's in there is going to know that's never the case all of the time. There's plenty of times that we're, you know, kicking the fence, hoping a client will actually listen to what we're saying because we're trying to save them some pain in some other way. Yeah, absolutely. This next one isn't a question, <laughs> but I want to read it out loud. How do I be you when I grow up? Seriously, amazing <laughs> session here today. <laughs> that, that might be the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. So whoever said that, thank you. Um, make a lot of, actually, there is an answer to that. There is truly an answer to that. Um, yes. Make a lot of mistakes go into Absolutely. everything with an open attitude of learning and a little bit of humility. And I unfortunately learned that the hard way early on. I was a very proud young person, um, thought I knew everything out of, out of college. Um, and I tell this story a lot. There was actually an HR manager at one of the first public firms I worked at who took me aside and told me I would never make it in a professional environment. I would never make it in accounting. Uh, and I should just cash in my chips now and find something else to do. And had I listened to her, I would not be doing this now, doing something I absolutely love to do every day and working with people that I adore working with. Um, so my advice is understand that it's okay to not know everything and be really open. I always tell my team, I will never fault you if you don't know something. Ask questions. So mm -hmm. even, and I make mistakes all the time. I'm human. So if you're coming to me, ask me a question if you think I've made a mistake. Ask questions if you think you've made a mistake. Just never stop questioning and learning. And that's really all it takes. It's not any special magic, I promise. <laughs> I'm inspired. I also want to be you when I grow up. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't know if we'll be able to really do justice to these other questions here. Um, so let's see. Well, we can tackle what we can. And then for anybody, if you don't get your question answered, connect with me, um, definitely seek me out on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'll let you guys know my email before we leave too, so that if you want to reach out to me and ask additional questions, you absolutely can. I love sharing knowledge. It's probably one of my favorite aspects of my job is getting to like help other people understand the space more. Amber, if you could drop your email in the chat, I yeah, think absolutely. folks can grab it because absolutely. we also have an, a question asking if they can get in touch with Graphite Financial. So that's perfect. I'm going to put it in the chat and then if people can't see it, I'm also going to put it in the Q&A because I'm not sure what does or doesn't show places. All right, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, this one, actually. Um, if you could briefly go over an example of reporting a crypto transaction, someone wants to know the debits and credits and how that works. It really depends on the transaction. I know that's like such a scapegoat answer, but the truth is, is it depends on what's happening. So I'm going to take one that doesn't end up ultimately requiring a whole lot of a transaction, and that's going to be a trade. Um, and kind of build off of that just to give people a general idea. So with a trade, there's, you know, you're swapping one currency for another. So think of it like you have a checking and a savings and you're moving money from one to another. Now in the cryptocurrency sense of it, you're changing it from one currency to another. So the only real financial thing happening is the fees involved with it. And so obviously that answer would be, you're going to debit your expense, which is the fees, and then you're gonna credit and reduce the account for digital assets. Um, others, it's really going to be very similar in nature to regular banking transactions. If you've got a deposit, then obviously you're going to be increasing your digital assets um, and re either recognizing it as revenue 
or you might be reducing some other account if you're transferring it from your bank. So it can get a little interesting sometimes hunting down like transactions that are happening in the company from fiat type accounts to digital asset accounts. Um, but it's very, it's a lot more like traditional transactions and cash flow than most people realize. It's just really learning to process and understand flow of funds. So it's like the best way to do it is start talking through and either shooting it off someone else or literally talking to yourself, which I do all day long, um, and saying out loud what you think is happening. And then just like with any other accounting process, sometimes you just open up an Excel workbook and you start typing in what you think is happening and you work it out very logically. And that's usually the easiest way to kind of get from A to C. Absolutely. I think, I think that's, we're at time here. I'm going to share a link in the chat to our Slack community. And I wanna encourage that anyone who has any additional questions, they can actually reach Amber or any of our other partners or the entire BitWave support team through that Slack community. Um, and if you if you have lingering questions, that's a really good resource for you to get into. Um, Jenny, I was also gonna suggest uh, if you could just paste uh, Amber's email to everyone. We don't have access oh, to, to send a message to everyone. I, I tried to add it in the Q&A, but I, unless I just answered somewhere, I wasn't I really sure. I think it went to hosting that. panelists, but it should be. Okay, to sorry. Everyone. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> See, I make mistakes all the time. Absolutely okay. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your knowledge share and like the breadth of information, breadth and depth of information, Amber. This was really an awesome first like kickoff of this series. I learned so much. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. It was an absolute blast. I love being able to talk about this topic. Um, and jokingly, I think I've said it to you before, but most people think accounting is dry and it can be so interesting when you approach it from a completely different perspective. So I want to make something that everyone's like, oh, accounting into something that they're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, that, thank you everyone for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, but go ahead and well, we'll go ahead and email out the Slack community link as well as the recording from this session. And hopefully we'll see you around in the Slack community. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.